grateful to all of you for uh, joining us for our second What Matters to Me and Why of the Year. As you know, this is our 15th year, so uh, it's a very special year, and we have an extraordinary lineup. Um, today, we're going to be he hearing from our special guest, uh, Gail Borden, who's a professor in the School of Architecture and also one of the associate deans there, and a faculty master at Parkside, and a recent mentor, a Mellon Mentoring Award winner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but before uh, we introduce the speaker, I just want to say a few things and plug a few events. The first the thing I want to say is that next month, as part of our 15-year uh, anniversary, we want to do something a little different. So uh, Manuel Pastor is going to be our speaker next month in November. But instead of doing it at Ground Zero, we're going to be doing it in the courtyard of the Fisher Museum. In a way, we're going to highlight the exhibition on environmental degradation that they're um, they're putting on this semester, and Manuel's talk will intersect with that, but it's also a different environment for us to have uh, this conversation. Outdoor, Fisher Courtyard, everything will be the same, free lunch, 12 o'clock, but we encourage you to join us uh, in our new location. It's just going to be for that one session, and then uh, in December, we'll be back here for Ange Marie Hancock. Um, a few uh, upcoming events that you might be interested in. One is tonight we're doing an event called Godless Politics, uh, the rise of Bernie Sanders, secular humanism, and the future of America. So this will be an event uh, really focusing on um, Bernie Sanders as uh, one of the first um, prominent atheist presidential candidates we've ever had. What does that mean for our country in terms of religion and politics, and what is the state of secular humanism? It's going to feature Diane Winston, who's the night chair of uh, religion and media at the Annenberg School, and Bart Campolo, who's the humanist chaplain here at USC. That's tonight at 7.30, ZHS 252, free and open to the public. And on October 25th, which is Parents Week, and the Sunday of Parents Week, and at 1 o'clock at the School of Cinematic Arts 108, we're going to be doing an event with the Oprah Winfrey Network. We're going to be showcasing her new docu-series called Belief. It's about the major world religions. It's a stunning uh, documentary series. The production value is just incredible. They go all over the world and highlight the different traditions. I think it's a great intergenerational conversation for our parents and their students. So please join us for Belief. It's, uh, like I said, uh, 1 o'clock, School of Cinematic Arts, room 108. So with all that being said, it gives me, as you know, one of the really um, wonderful features about our series is that the speakers are um, nominated by students uh, and introduced by students. Uh, so I'm very grateful to introduce you to our student today, uh, Nicholas Owaijan. He's a fifth year architecture student um, and he's here to introduce uh, Gail Borden. So please join me in welcoming Nicholas. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity to be able to introduce Gail. Um, I had written a thing, but I think I may just tell you guys why I really like Gail. Um, <laughs> so um, for those of you that don't know, um, Gail Borden has a million titles in the architecture school. Um, and for a long time for me, Gail was this like mythical figure that was on the third floor and he would just go in and out and was working on things I would never know what they were about. Um, but I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to uh, do a research fellowship with him over the summer. Um, and throughout that fellowship, I found out that he was a lot more than just like this enigmatic figure, you know. He's a real person and a really down to earth guy. And that's what I really appreciated the most. Um, throughout the entire time, uh, while we were doing the research, I never got the feeling that Gail was interested in other things or, or anything like that. He was very present always, and that's something big for architecture, which is so uh, emotional and everyone's so involved. And um, when we would put the installation up, which you guys can still see at the Religious Center, um, or we were doing any number of other projects, Gail was on his hands and knees helping us out the entire time. Um, and I think that says a lot about uh, his character. It's, I think it's really easy um, when you get to a position where you don't necessarily have to do things, do those things to not do them. But you can tell that Gail really, really loves to work with his hands and partake in this thing, you know, not stand at a distance. So that's what I really appreciated. And what that taught me was uh, that actually gave me hope that later on, someday, I could do something that I really wanted to do. Um, and still make a living doing it. So I want to thank you, Gail, for like reminding me that uh, it is possible. <laughs> um, and I do want to teach. And um, doing the research fellowship under Gail um, 
really helped me understand what it meant to be a good teacher, to let uh, someone pursue what it is they would like to pursue, but really guide them um, and keep them on the right track, but enable those freedoms that, um, that that student expects. So I really appreciate you, Gail. I'm really glad uh, I had that opportunity. Uh, I'm going to carry it with me for a really long time. Uh, if, you ever, if you ever run into him, please talk to him. He's more than an architect that is, you know, FAIA, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Discipline Head, million titles, five degrees, whatever. He's a great guy, um, and uh, I think he's uh, what all architects should strive for as well as people in general. So I'm going to give it up for Gail, and uh, thanks again, guys. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nick. That's such a generous uh, introduction, um, and uh, probably not not fully deserved by any means. But uh, thanks again for coming out, and um, I wanted to thank Varun for including me in this series. It's uh, it's uh, really amazing that uh, what matters to me and why is in its fifteenth uh, year. So it's a it's a spectacular opportunity to kind of survey. Uh, the entire uh, faculty and administration here at USC and listen to uh, different conversations uh, about what people do and what uh, really drives them, I think, in their individual disciplines, but towards their, a kind of larger intellectual um, agenda. Uh, for me, this lecture uh, is a little bit uh, unique uh, in that, again, it's not a kind of traditional. I speak a lot about my own work where I give uh, public lectures. Actually, Varun, maybe could we bring the lights down just a tad? Yeah. Um, where I speak a lot about my own work and uh, really uh, delve into very specific uh, projects, tasks, opportunities, kind of de personal design processes, and um, you know how uh, I creatively begin to uh, answer through design uh, so opportunities and 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 problems that that are kind of confronting. The other is the more academic lecture, which is really about a kind of conveyance of information and a kind of systemic uh, delivery of a, of a kind of larger um, body of knowledge towards an, another generation, really trying to challenge and, and kind of confront them. This is really a fantastic opportunity because I actually have probably an audience that's largely non-architects, uh, non non-design based, and so I wanted to take a, a little bit of a different a different tact and try to um, inspire you to expect more, I guess, of the, of the built environment, of the world uh, around us, and uh, ultimately to kind of expect beauty. So that was the kind of a fundamental driver here in terms of things. Um, we could even just kill the spot, and maybe the images would be a little bit uh, better to see. I don't even know if we need the light, if that's possible. But... Um, so I, I like to start with this image. This image to me is always a kind of evocative one uh, because it, it starts with something that is um, intensely primal, uh, this, this kind of animalistic urge, which I think exists in the core of every kind of living being or, or natural system. Um, but then it also uh, instigates a very specific moment, a kind of distortion of form based on kind of fluid dynamics, uh, a kind of evocative uh, condition where you understand uh, a very specific uh, object or system, but it's taken out of its kind of regular context. And ultimately it produces a kind of uh, event uh, that, that even through the stillness of the image somehow instigates consideration of these larger processes and uh, sensibilities. So as a kind of point of departure, it, it really, I think, begins to seed a kind of conversation. So architecture, like what, what is architecture? Uh, and I think that's something that is ultimately, uh, I mean, architecture has a, a great kind of ambiguity about where its boundaries lie. We actually, as an umbrella, have a lot of different disciplinary silos underneath ourselves. But for me, I've always really thought of architecture as everything. And I don't mean that in a territorial sensibility, but rather the idea that architects have a kind of heroic opportunity and responsibility ability to synthesize um, everything uh, in the world from from our history to our 
our, our, to matter, to economics, to life safety, uh, to energy and sustainability, uh, to social infrastructures, to aspirational goals for what society should be about, that there's a desire to bring to it a sensibility, a kind of clarity, and an intention. And the media of architecture, then, is not really just buildings, but rather extends into everything from um, the, the graphic design to furniture to really social infrastructures, business models, even kind of uh, the kind of larger structures for political and, and even social consideration. So one fundamental tenant in, uh, and don't worry, I will show, I will show, not just show words, I will show ultimately some images. I'm gonna try and inspire you guys with some images later. But uh, for, for me, a, a fundamental tenant to design is, and I think it's a descriptive kind of point of departure for, for my sensitivity uh, in, as, a, as a maker, is uh, that design should be a celebration of inevitability. That it's not about um, just a newness necessarily or um, even an in, in invention that's uh, solely uh, independent of, of other influences, but rather about uh, beginning to understand the networks and systems in which we operate and finding a way to kind of uh, harness them and begin to control them. You know, on some levels, there's, there's, a, there's an old parable, and I'll, I'm sure I'll get it wrong, but there's two monks walking in the woods, and they fall into a river. And one swims upstream and becomes tired and drowns. And the other swims downstream and can begin to control his path and actually uh, divert himself safely to shore. That's not to say that architecture or design or any kind of creative act should not be um, contrarian, that it should be subordinate, but rather the idea of understanding one's context and beginning to kind of play with them. And as an architect, you know, we have everything, you know, egress issues and code and, you know, construction and budget and there's going to be outlets. So, you know, embracing those things as points of departure and opportunities is kind of critical. So I also believe in the tenet of the idea of thinking through making. And at the root of that is materiality, uh, which is an area of personal research and what a lot of my books and actually my practice is even really rooted in. But material is more than just the kind of physical matter. That's uh, a kind of point of departure. But when we bring to a material, a specific tool, we then engage a process and we begin to think about how we uh, aggregate things, how we make things larger than ourselves, which architecture does, which means inevitably competential construction, which then means how we bring things together in terms of geometry and how they perform and everything from our social interactions to our, our ne necessary technical, tectonics, all that comes together to be making. But fundamentally, at the root of that, there's still a need to be inspirational with that. So today, I want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of power of objects. Um, as an American architect, uh, I'm very interested in the kind of uh, cultural and intellectual constructs that surround the kind of terrain in which I, I ha have to operate. Um, and, I, and, and I truly believe that in a democratic political system, in combination with, again, a capitalist economic system, and ultimately, again, I think there's a tertiary argument about an agrarian uh, foundation to our, to our nation, um, but there, that there's intrinsically a power through objects, um, and that ultimately that power uh, resides in the user, in the consumer, in how we operate on a kind of daily basis. And so if there's a power in objects, um, and that in fact uh, we are able to be defined by and define the world by the objects we consume, there then should be a kind of consciousness about how to uh, evaluate them. And even everyday decisions uh, about, uh, you know, uh, how, where, where a piece of clothing is made or, or how a coffee bean is delivered or, you know, how we build a skyscraper, th there's, there's intrinsic in those um, larger systemic um, influences that we have the opportunity to insert ourselves into. And so for me, that's this kind of higher expectation um, is a kind of expectation of us. So uh, again, if, if you believe that objects have this opportunity of power, then we actually have, should have greater expectations of what those objects are about, about how they're made, about what they do, and about how they begin to operate. So again, this comes back to this idea of expecting beauty. Um, I, think, I think architecture is something that 
all of us engage, whether we uh, consciously consider it. Um, it's something that you move through on a daily basis. It's the built environment. It's, uh, it's, it's everything. It's the clothes you wear. It's, it's really a, a way of, of seeing the world. And so um, when, I, when I say that, when I say expect beauty, I, I don't mean that necessarily in a superficial way. Um, it gets into the history of aesthetics, which is a whole other lecture series. Uh, and really, people would argue perhaps the sort of fundamental calling of, of, of art and what, what, our, what our elements are. But rather that um, beauty to me is, is you know, and, and the old adage says, in the eye of the beholder. And I think beauty varies from individual to individual. And I think that that goes to this idea of identity and, and hierarchy in our own decision making about what's important to us and uh, why those things are important. So for, for me, I wanted to move through I, what I thought were sort of four different typologies of, of beauty and talk a little bit about um, what each of those can offer. So I'll start with the first, which is um, maybe on some levels the most superficial, but at the other level the most kind of emotive. But the idea of the beauty of delight, uh, the idea that uh, objects should should make us uh, smile, they should um, bring happiness, they should uh, give a kind of enlightenment. Um, this is, uh, and I, for, uh, I apologize, the logos, actually, can we still just kill the lights so we could see the slides maybe? Uh, I apologize, the, the actual uh, descriptions are very, very small, so I'll try to reference what everything is. But on the left is a, um, this is actually a street artist in uh, New York that does these uh, little uh, animals out of uh, recycled um, uh, plastic bags, and he ties them to subway grates. And so when the subway goes by and that kind of uh, air pressure uh, comes up through the exhaust grate, it inflates and it becomes this kind of animal in a way. Um, and so it's just this a way of opportunity. So this guy's walking home from the grocery store and sort of petting this imaginary uh, uh, air bear. You know, on the right is actually from a pretty influential show at uh, the Museum of Modern Art, which had a variety of different process-based tools. And this was a uh, this was actually a kind of machine which, which harnesses, you can kind of see that little uh, rectangle, a, a spray paint can, and it begins to map as people move through the gallery. Uh, it moves and actually uh, charts a kind of line across the space, and so it becomes a kind of drawing uh, machine. Um, this is a, a chair by the Campania brothers, uh, which again is the idea, of, uh, it's based in material, it's based in commodity, it's based in objects, but it, it's this idea of, a, of, of an assemblage uh, of a variety of uh, uh, kind of everyday objects into another everyday object, but something that kind of makes you sort of smile. And if you don't like pandas, they did uh, alligators or, or dolphins and sharks, uh, or all animals in one, but that kind of amusement about what things can potentially be. This, this is um, an, a photographer that actually looked at vernacular housing types in the, in the South, uh, the historic South, the kind of dog trots and shotgun um, um, and a variety of other different uh, salt box and uh, these, these sort of uh, very common architectural types that were photographed. And as an art forum, you often do a kind of advertisement for your show. He took a very different approach as opposed to showing a, a photograph. He actually created this little uh, kind of uh, pop-up. So when you open the page of the magazine, a kind of uh, the architecture kind of appeared and sort of became emblematic of what you were going to see in a way as a term of amusement. You know, others are, you know, ideas of erosion here. So this is a sink, right? Uh, but that it uses very complicated milling processes and a variety of things. But it talks about how, you know, erosion happens over time and references, obviously, kind of natural processes. Um, some are more, you know, uh, sort of humorous in terms of things, right? Uh, understanding just the typology of a bag. And so here's a, a kind of exercise equipment company. And those things potentially translating into architecture. Architecture, it's difficult to deal with amusement uh, because, um, we're a more permanent kind of undertaking. But this is a, a small project in uh, New York City, the, the Iniani Coffee Shop by Louis Sermaki Lewis, where they literally used the materials of the kind of coffee cup. It's actually very... Uh, appropriate, we're here in ground zero. But they use the materials of the coffee cup, the corrugated cardboard, uh, the insulating uh, band, the, the, the plastic um, of the, the actual caps that were in the original kind of sheet cuts. And they became the kind of wrapper. So they used this kind of layering of the cardboard as a kind of acoustical uh, barrier. They, they actually uh, hung sheets of the, of the caps as a kind of veil. And so an idea about referencing through um, the sort of context of which you're there to get coffee, but you're kind of inside of the coffee in a new way. 
The second is uh, as a classification, and there's overlaps in all of these, and I think many of them could slide between, is the idea of performative beauty. And performative beauty, you know, performance is a, is a whole other uh, kind of to uh, maybe loaded topic. I think it, it has functional performance. There's ideas of uh, actual uh, expectation that it's, it's doing something for in terms of energy, in terms of uh, function, in terms of um, a kind of response to a problem in a very specific way. Um, and for many of those things, sometimes they, they, they emerge, again, I think, out of uh, natural systems. Um, you know, again, here on the left, uh, a kind of biologic system. This is at the moment of a kind of, this is a spectacular photograph at a moment of a cesarean section where the child's hand is kind of emerging for the first time into the world. But to think about the beauty of that, of, of the natural systems of, of life and reproduction and how that works, to the kind of cockpit on the right here, this is a kind of 747, and all the, the kind of toggle points uh, by which we can control and sort of, uh, you know, navigate and uh, influence uh, motion. Uh, so, so the idea here that these 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 touch points uh, provide a kind of opportunity. Again, and then and then in natural systems that there's this kind of performative quality. This is actually uh, a kind of the underside of a, of a sort of cellular uh, mushroom structure, uh, but it, it has a kind of. Uh, a hyper uh, efficiency in terms of how it how it can grow, how it can self ventilate, and then also how it can actually per perform structurally uh, as a as a kind of or or organic uh, system. And this is a, a, a burner unit from a, a, a simple kind of uh, stove burner, but it actually, again, looks towards natural systems. This uses the same organizing pattern that the sunflower uses for its seeds to distribute equally, which also works uh, to optimize a kind of uh, radial heating, obviously, of a, of a kind of conventional uh, cook surface. Um, two things which we think of as is incredibly kind of utilitarian, but um, in fact, you know, as a tool, there's a kind of uh, there's an anthropomorphic scale. There's a there's a kind of the functionalism to to it all, uh, and a and a kind of primalism in each of these sort of performative kind of characteristics. And then I think that performance has a capability of not always just being the kind of baseline um, engineered sort of sensibility. Um, this on the left is a, actually a, a fence that was developed for the New York Park system, uh, which actually allows the kind of regularized fence to sort of de deform and distend. So it becomes a kind of bench in some places, a kind of cubby, a, a sort of table, a variety of different things. Or even on the right, this is a, a doorknob designed by uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, which takes a very simple kind of plane, but then it deforms where your thumb and forefingers kind of hit. And so it kind of ergonometrically um, begins to respond to a very ritualistic action, but somehow instills in it a kind of uh, beauty. Uh, or here, again, another kind of a moment of contact in architecture, a handle for a, a massive kind of concrete door, or the roof of uh, Renzo Piano's uh, addition to the High in High Museum of Art in Atlanta, which uses uh, a kind of uh, metal panel system that folds up the surface and then curls around these uh, this roof of uh, individual ocular uh, uh, skylights that uh, create an incredibly beautiful uh, but evenly lit upper gallery to that space. And then there's these moments of kind of hybridity, again, these sort of functionalist moments where, um, you know, and again, like, this is like kind of wearable technology um, where, where uh, literally, you know, the keyboard appears when you sit down kind of a thing, uh, but there, there's an idea of, of, of a kind of smartness being built into things. Um, or even the performance of how we begin to engage with things. This is... Um, this is an annual report, which um, you know, if if, uh, if you invest in a kind of a publicly held company, they send annual reports. This was for a uh, cooking company in uh, Central Europe, and they sent this uh, report out, which was uh, quite beautiful. It was this larger book, uh, which you can see on the right, and in, in it, it had this uh, smaller book, and with that, it, it was this blank book, uh, but it had these instructions, and so you you wrapped that book, and then you baked that book for a duration. And after you baked it, the, the uh, images, words appeared on the page because it was a thermally activated uh, uh, ink. So there was this idea of literally transposing, you know, as a cooking company, somehow the idea that you had to, like, bake your own uh, annual report uh, was a kind of uh, really rich idea, but one that engaged you in the kind of systemic processes.
And then there's, uh, there's, there's myriad uh, high-tech and low-tech uh, examples of performative architecture. Um, this is one I, I particularly like, the Marika Alderton House uh, by Glenn Merkett, which is built in a very uh, rural location of Australia. Um, by Glenn Market, who's a spectacular Pritzker Prize winning uh, architect, but one that um, really embraces kind of fully its sort of uh, tectonic logic. It had to be, you know, componential construction so that it could be carried onto the site. It had to be lightweight, but it also had to perform with uh, kind of tremendous efficiency. It's clearly kind of off grid. Uh, it needed to deal with uh, ventilation and uh, very uh, harsh rainy seasons and, and a variety of different open and closed kind of configurations. Um, and so the idea that a building could become a kind of uh, machine for a living that's uh, hyper-tuned to uh, a sensibility of place and, and um, use is, you know, again, that kind of quality of performative beauty. And then uh, recently, I don't know, the PS1 uh, does an annual uh, installation in its uh, the courtyard um, at the, the former um, public school turned into a kind of contemporary art space. They always uh, do a competition and commission an architect to do an, an installation. And this is uh, by David Benjamin of The Living, which uses these... Uh, it was really about a zero, uh, a net zero uh, kind of use of material because these temporary pavilions go up for the summer and then they get taken down. And so he wanted to uh, pursue something that was literally kind of made of waste and then returned back to its process, not leaving anything. So the these were a series of kind of composted, composted bricks that threw a kind of self a biological process, kind of self-cured. They didn't fire in the traditional way of like a, a, a tunnel kiln does, uh, but rather used the metabolic processes of, of uh, decay, essentially the same uh, idea of, uh, of heat that discharges during the composting process was used to actually fire these bricks. But they still remained completely uh, organic and thus could be kind of reground up at the end. And so the molds, those reflective bricks at the top were actually what caused the kind of incubation of the heat. And then they created this gravitationally stacked um, shape, which was kind of this massive uh, tower that worked as a kind of cooling tower. So then the third type is the idea of uh, expressive, or what I would call kind of process beauty, um, which is, uh, again, I think something that's um, rooted in modernity, you know, here maybe typified through uh, Jackson Pollock's work, which was not just as much uh, about, or was not, was not as only about the kind of final product, but rather the actual um, embedding of the action of the painter's movement uh, into the surface itself. So when you stand in front of one of these canvases, you can visually and uh, even physically unpack the actual actions that the, that the creator took, the kind of movement, the sequence, the layering, the depth, the actual you know, arc of, a, of an arm and the kind of relationship as to uh, uh, how his process of creation was embedded very much in the kind of final work. There's examples of that in architecture, um, and this is, a, this is a spectacular one. This is by Le Corbusier. Uh, this is a, a housing complex, the Unité de Habitation in, in Marseille, uh, which was uh, built in the middle of the last century. It was essentially a low or affordable uh, housing solution, um, all built out of uh, concrete. And uh, he, as an architect, took, took on the plasticity of that material, but also understood the relationship uh, that the material has to its, its formwork and the ability to actually control how you cast something to actually leave an impression in the final surface of the kind of qualities uh, of, the, of the actual making. And so knowing he had a very uh, poorly skilled workforce, uh, he, he took on the opportunities to actually um, engage those kinds of misalignments and imperfections to produce a series of kind of patterning effects um, that work really beautifully through, again, serial use of the same formwork, but then there's misregistration, which creates this beautiful kind of pillowing and kind of quality of texture and a kind of organi organicism and, and even human scale that otherwise wouldn't have um, existed if this had been truly kind of monolithic and, and, and um, singular in its surface. To uh, more contemporary... Um, um, Architects that are that are dealing with ideas of of um, material as a as an as an opportunity for a kind of a responsive or a touchstone a touchstone 
part of a design process. Um, this on the left is actually a, a, a the for Ricola. It's a storage facility which uses this kind of shingled system, which actually has open ventilation at the bottom, which allows for uh, natural air movement through it and a kind of very uh, evocative uh, kind of performative quality, but through a very simple sort of uh, well-considered wall system. On the right, this is a switching station, um, which uses uh, uh, copper fins that are um, slightly twisted along their length, and so they allow uh, to become kind of visually open at certain points in the composition and then closed at others. So it took a very standard idea of a kind of sighting technique, but then introduced a kind of complexity that allowed for a kind of performance to it. Um, or it's Stephen Hole's addition to the Kansas City Art Museum, uh, the kind of iconic uh, neoclassical uh, building. Uh, where he added a series of pavilions that kind of cascade al along the side of the formal lawn, uh, but then are clad in this um, kind of evocative channel glass that at night become these um, spectacular kind of lanterns of, of, of light and, and space. Um, to two other projects by Herzog and Amiron. On the left, this is actually a, uh, a photo engraved formwork. Uh, if you if you etch uh, a metal uh, formwork, uh, you can you can through a variety of processes, either milled or acid etch, you can actually impregnate in the surface of the concrete through the, the way that the the, the concrete cures it, it. It creates a slightly different water to cement ratio, uh, but it, it it impregnates an image. And so they were able to. Uh, this was a library, um, and so they took these iconic images um, and then made a variety of different forms that then were able to become the kind of uh, surface of the building. Uh, again, it's only concrete, uh, but again, by, by changing the kind of process by which it works. Or on the right, this is the Prada Tokyo, where they used a, a kind of diagrid, but then insert into the sort of standardized module a variety of inward-facing, outward-facing, smooth, differentiating types of glass that create a variety, variety of textures. Or here, even just a simple um, bathroom, which is kind of spectacular, sort of a, this is by Kingo Kuma, uh, and it's it's an all wood um, s sort of um, um, ritualistic space for bathing, a kind of everyday activity, um, a material that's organic, a wood obviously, uh, but something that wants to. It has a has a love hate relationship with water, uh, and so here thinking thinking through how it could begin to perform as a vessel, as a lattice, as a kind of solid monolith, as a, a, a planar material, as a as a segmental and incrementally, um, you know, um, porous material, but to create this kind of beautiful and sort of tac tactile tactile environment. And then material beauty, uh, again, to come back to something that is uh, very near and dear to, to me. I'll do a kind of shameless plug. So I write about materials, and so these are uh, four of my uh, recent books in the last, I guess, five or six years. Uh, but they really look at the kind of... Uh, the genealogy of materiality in terms of what it what it means in the creative process and how it has an intrinsic kind of quality uh, towards how we make. And so this is a slide that I often use, um, but it shows uh, three the uh, seemingly kind of similar looking objects um, in that they maybe uh, sh share a kind of commonality of color. They're varied in scale and obviously massively different in kind of materiality and the the, the processes that, that generate them. On the far left, a kind of metal piece, which takes a kind of tremendous amount of energy and, and force and, and uh, complexity to shape uh, planar material into something that, that, that figuration. The middle, uh, uh, obviously, is a, a, a balloon. Uh, so there's a tremendous network of guy wires inside of that, that that are trying to hold it in place to fight against the natural kind of uh, form form uh, and pr equal pressure on surface. And then on the right, a very small kind of figurine, which is made through uh, 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 injected molded uh, ro rotational uh, formwork that is, uh, again, has a different kind of sensibility and plasticity. So there's a kind of process to each of these and a kind of quality that emerges out of what they're made out of and determines very much how they, how they are formed. 
Um, these are two slides. This is a two images I like on on the on the left. Uh, this is actually a, an artwork. Uh, but everybody's first bookcase is supposed to be the kind of concrete blocks with a plank of wood, and so this artist inverted that. So the uh, concrete is cast as the plank, and then the blocks are made out of wood. So there's a kind of reference to a traditional formalism with a differentiation of uh, material, and the same on the right where you can now you know crochet your breakfast kind of. So this idea of transposition is kind of significant. When we talk about material, it's also where it all comes from. And so m most materials that we, we think of, even if we uh, don't, don't have them, if they're very man-made and produced in their final state, they still originate in a very uh, natural world in which we, you know, we're still sort of gathering from, which is a kind of incredibly sort of primitive way to think of it. But these are two uh, images of a, of a quarry in northern Italy. And uh, it creates this kind of spectacular and heroic scale when you realize that these are the kind of earth movers, those small machines, um, but they produce this kind of spectacular uh, kind of condition uh, by which they're sort of cutting and quarrying the, the, the marble. This is a, uh, a project which I think is at the root of kind of modernism's um, relationship with materiality. This is by Lou Kahn. This is the Exeter Library in Exeter, New Hampshire. And here, this is, uh, some of you may have heard, he had a very famous uh, quote where he asked the brick what he wanted it to be, and uh, the brick told him, uh, allegedly, this is what it wanted to be. I don't know. Uh, maybe the brick wants to be a pile of bricks. But uh, the here, w what he did was, is, it, was think about how the material in which you make something out of, again, expresses itself into the object that makes it. So it's, it, there's a lot of uh, sophisticated readings to it, but from the, uh, the very fundamentals of things, he never dimensioned this building. And our, as architects, we often draw dimensions in feet and inches of what things should be, and we tell everybody what size is. In this, he dimensioned it in terms of numbers of bricks. And so it was literally a column should be eight bricks long by two bricks wide. Uh, he used a coursing uh, to actually make this truly load bearing. Uh, I Maybe everybody knows it already, or I hate to break it to you, but there's not a load bearing masonry building on the USC campus, even though we have a lot of masonry buildings, uh, which means they're not actually structural uh, brick. Uh, in this, each of the, the kind of columns that are created, they taper by a one brick at each, uh, at each floor level. And so he makes up for that in the jack arch, which is actually a transitional arch above each window. So there's a lot of sophistication in something that's seemingly very sort of left over. And then you'll see even on the surface, there's this kind of uh, shadowy uh, uh, texture. He, he uh, mixed into it um, what are called clinker bricks, which are um, during the firing process. They they stack the raw uh, pressed or extruded uh, bricks, and some some get too too close to the the, the, the heat source, and so they deform and actually um, usually are th are thrown away. Now that still happens, but people they're they're plucked out of the the process. Here he wanted them for a kind of organic texture and a kind of quality. And then on the inside, you know, switches to this. That's the outer brick veil and an inner kind of concrete veil. Um, but a kind of beautifully integrated sort of sensibility of uh, structure to skin. Everything you touch in this building is wood. Uh, the brick is used as the natural fireplaces. Uh, I'll tell you, to integrate a kind of mechanical system and lighting system this way is almost impossible. So there's a fan and, and ventilation at the bottom. So there's, there's, there's things that are kind of spectacular from an architectural standpoint. But they spatially uh, really just create a kind of evocative and, and, and effective quality. Uh, this is uh, Peter Zumthor, a, a kind of contemporary practitioner in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he won the Pritzker Prize a few years ago. But he builds um, in relatively remote but um, sort of sp in relatively small projects that are truly uh, spectacular in their consideration and, and, and um, sensibility. This is a St. Benedict's Chapel, a very small uh, hillside community chapel uh, that really takes on wood as a kind of indigenous material and then is used in uh, myriad ways as kind of stick structure, as shingle surface, as a variety of, of, of kind of components and relationships, understanding the kind of relationship to the ground and to water and to patina but always towards a kind of effectual uh, uh, quality in terms of w what, the, what the material can be and, and wants to be and, and how uh, this sort of scale can create a kind of field and that field can create an effect. Um, 
and then uh, he also did the these thermal baths on the right. Um, and these were, uh, they're the next series are kind of a, a series of kind of juxtapositions of, a, of an artist on the left with a kind of architect on the right, uh, trying to make again this sort of larger argument that. Um, it's it's a synthetic kind of undertaking. So uh, James Terrell, an artist that works directly with light uh, to create objects um, uh, that that are environments that are kind of phenomenologically experienced, but architects that are operating in a very sort of a similar sensibility that are uh, making spaces that are functional and pragmatic, but that are uh, truly kind of sp spectacular in terms of their their experiential and aspirational qualities about how, again, the objects around us can enlighten us and, and, and liberate us. And then Richard Serra, who does these amazing kind of uh, torqued, torqued core 10. And then the last category is what I would call kind of the beauty of other. Um, sometimes that's otherworldly, um, but something that is uh, evocative and inspirational. This is a photographer named uh, Thomas Demand who does these uh, beautiful photographs. He makes these vignettes all out of folded paper, and then he photographs them, and then he destroys the, the model itself. And so in every one of the photos, they look like these ubiquitous things. They deal with contemporary society, obviously, you know, issues surrounding security at the airports in a post-9-11 era. But if you zoom in on the, the, at some point, the level of detail breaks down, and you can't go deeper. So like the phone doesn't have any buttons, right? Because it, it just simply reaches a, a level of scale. So it's this kind of spectacular pro sensibility. And so here is a kind of, a, uh, this is the Unabomber's house on the right, or the uh, this is a, a kind of testing facility for uh, bombing pilots. Uh, but these I the idea of producing out of this single material uh, and then photographing these, these moments, this kind of ritualistic thing. Uh, this is uh, by Olafur Eliasson. This was actually his childhood home uh, that he, he cut uh, the section out of a, a, a book. He kind of die cut it. Uh, so it creates, as you turn the pages, you move through the kind of thickness of his house. And so there's this kind of nostalgia about a kind of capturing of space that creates a kind of other worldliness. Um, or there's Michael Heiser's double negative in the Nevada desert. I, I take students every summer on a two week tour from here to West Texas that look at land art and architecture in the Southwest as a kind of touchstone. And we visit this and many other uh, monumental spiral jetty to uh, Chinati. Um, we, we visit these kind of iconic and heroic sites that um, again are about making things in the landscape that are of a very specific place. Um, to patterns both natural and um, uh, man-made that, again, have a kind of complexity and a, and a sort of destabilization from that which we might be aware of and constantly know. And again, I think there's a larger argument. I mean, here is a Van Gogh on the left and a Pollock on the right about mark making and uh, the idea of, of creating an otherworldliness, even if it is still referential to the natural landscape. The, the brilliance of Van Gogh is the detachment, you know, the understanding of the mark and a, and a primalism of the way in which it's made that still evokes a sensibility of the origin, origin but then detaches it in its own kind of um, 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 complexity. Um, to a kind of uh, Donald Judd, a kind of uh, personal um, sort of influence, uh, the uh, kind of father of minimalism, even though he hated the, the term. Um, but it kind of, it generated a return to an essentialism of both material and an insertion of the body into the, and, and ultimately the viewer as, as a person experiencing within the composition and thus being forced to engage with their own sensibilities the way in which we, we view an object. Um, and again, you know, Terrell, uh, you know, he did a spectacular retrospective at LACMA just a year or two ago. Hopefully everybody was able to see it. But he creates both kind of object-based but totally environmentally based e e um, experiences that are all rooted in a true kind of understanding of, of light and perception, which are really the kind of touchstones. And those exist in the natural world. So here, you know, the sand, the wind patterns in the sand, or here what seems to be chaotic kind of moments, but again, this is uh, by the same designers that did the stuffed animal chair, but they use the uh, trash from the favelas uh, to create kind of structural aggregations that are each individuated, even though they're systemically the same. But a kind of beauty and a sensibility of pattern that emerges out of the everyday, from the kind of construction fence on the left to the kind of Vernoy construction on the right. 
or um, this is uh, uh, Thomas Heatherwick's uh, British Pavilion for the Shanghai Expo, which um, used a series of these acrylic rods, and at the base of each was a different uh, seed family. And so they radiated light into the interior, but then you could examine the tip, and in the tip was a kind of oculus of these originating seeds from each nationality. Um, but the idea of light and the idea of experience of space and, and the kind of quality and scale, these are things that we should expect in everyday, I think, experiences. And though I'm sh sharing kind of heroic moments, um, some like old for Eliasson that are more weather-based or environmental-based, um, should I think be more kind of um, everyday-based uh, expectations of how we, how we experience the world. These are pieces, this is a piece by Tara Donovan, and I think I included a couple, um, but they use everyday objects. These are actually styrofoam cups um, that are just aggregated, but they deform and create a kind of topography. This is a field of plastic cups that are just stacked within themselves or a wall of drinking straws, uh, but they each are slightly shifted off of uh, planarity, and so they create this kind of amazing sort of undulating and enigmatic surface. These are some of my own work, which I know I'm running out of time, so I won't really speak towards, but this was an installation uh, with two parts, a kind of triangulated uh, spa variable space frame in the front and an inflated uh, kind of descriptive geometry-based pavilion in the back, which was up at Materials and Applications a couple of years ago. Uh, but the air inflated piece um, was you kind of entered into and it sort of recognized you and then it inflated as you came close to it and then you kind of move inside of it. And then actually uh, Varun and Reverend Burklow asked me to do a kind of iterative version of it here at the University Religious Center uh, about three or four years ago um, where we, we used the same parts but we wrote a piece of software that allowed us to create a new form um, and then we sort of inserted this much more contextual sort of inflatable piece on top of it. Um, this is Santa's Glass Museum, which tries to, I think mean, the architecture, this is like the pinnacle of dematerialization. The walls become nothing but glass, and so the building literally is this veil of, of absence. And in a way, it, it's so de dematerialized, you're, you're, you become more aware of your own kind of heartbeat. It's like being in an anaerobic chamber or something. Um, and then a chapel by Peter Zumthor, which uses a very simple process. They essentially built a kind of teepee of logs, uh, and then they, they rammed a kind of dry concrete around it in these layers, which you can see as a course. And then they burned out the logs on the inside. And in the process, it gave this amazing kind of patina, but it actually subtracted it out of the, of the, the center, the actual space the body begins to occupy. And so you get this spectacular kind of quality and texture to a very sort of small spiritual space uh, that's open air, but incredibly kind of heroic in its, in its scale and, and kind of quality. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, I'm sorry. And then I think finally, this is, this is uh, the Blur Building by Diller and Scafidio. This was done for the Hanover Expo, but is actually a building which is trying to fully be a kind of cloud, uh, to be uh, a sort of, it's, a, it's, it's something like 30,000 misters all set on this large aperture. Um, you entered off these bridges, and actually you, you were given these uh, raincoats, which actually had sensors in them, and so they changed color based on your mood, and they talked to other raincoats and things, and so you'd go into this weird dematerialized world uh, over this lake and then you meet people and you crest in and out of it uh, but you find sort of find other people in this haze and in a way it's this kind of again this evaporation of the kind of what we're aware of or used to but there's something that gives us a kind of liberation for that so the last two slides are really a kind of encouragement for all of you to demand more of the world around you and to really think about decisions at all scales, that even a very small decision, when um, taken at a kind of, and, and amplified at a, at a kind of massiveness of scale, has a, has a real consequence to it. And uh, again, I think gives every one of us the kind of opportunity and responsibility to insert ourselves into the larger uh, networks of the, of the global population, to change politics, to change uh, humanity, to change the, the built environment, all through the kind of everyday decisions that we, we make. So uh, again, I encourage you to expect beauty and really let it play a role in the everyday. I'll leave it there. Thank you.
So I don't know if there exist any, but Varun said if there are questions, I'm happy to field them, though I know we're almost out of time. So, so. we are almost out of time, but let's have uh, one question. I'm sure Gail will stick around to speak with anyone else who has any questions. So if you have a question, I ask that you come up to the microphone and ask it. <clears throat> I really have a bunch of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the simplest one is simply how do you balance um, building things and doing things with teaching people? Uh, because one has one kind of effect that lasts forever, right. and then the other one is a very literal translation of your ideas. Right. I mean, that's the kind of penultimate question. And in some ways, I mean, I'm, one aspiration I had uh, out of this lecture was to make a, a room of better consumers and clients out there, to expect and demand out of everything you buy and uh, make. And you'll have opportunities, I think, to, to curate and instigate things in your life. Uh, you know, myriad opportunities. So the hope is, is that, again, I think, I think that's one thing that always um, drove me to academia, that you know, I realized uh, that a, even an incredibly prolific architect could maybe build three or 400 buildings in a lifetime. And those are typically, although now we have more star architects who practice all over the world, but most architects tend to practice regionally and thus can have an influence on a place, but to, to actually have a kind of massive influence on a kind of global society is very, very difficult. Um, as, a, as an educator, you're blessed, I think, with the opportunity to uh, actually insert yourself into not just the creation of the kind of products that we make in any one discipline, but actually to insert yourself into the, the creation of the producers of all the products. And, and the hope is, is that you can inspire our students, and we have such spectacular ones like Nick here at USC that it makes it easy for us, but uh, that you can embed in them the kind of uh, principles of, 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 the, the, of similar aspirations, I guess. Uh, and that's directly into students. But then also, I mean, that was, you know, one big part of also being like a faculty master here and having a kind of life beyond just my siloed school uh, was the opportunity to, to say that, you know, architecture or anything, I can't, any discipline is really for everyone. I mean, that that there's a need and we all engage all of these these issues and thoughts and opportunities. And so... Uh, but to, to, to really foreground it and allow, allow people to maybe take a brief moment to recognize the significance of a poet or a musician or, you know, and it's not just consuming a song while you're waiting at a stoplight, that it really is a, a kind of dedicated creative production that has a, a really sophisticated original intent. And so, you know, I think any uh, creative art form sort of deserves that attention. And I think architecture, I gotta tell you, I, I, I maybe I'm uh, a little too autobiographical, but I always feel like we are the, the always at the worst scenario, that you know we are really, uh, every other discipline I always feel is heralded much more and we're the underdog in some ways. And uh, I'll tell you, I've sat in so many meetings where it's like, you know, the budget is this and the client is that and the contractor is this and like, man, architecture is just not in the room and you're the only one who's allowed to even bring it in and you're just trying to fight it up this hill and it's a kind of uh, Sisyphusian task of, you know, you know it's going to roll back down the next day, but you've got to somehow try because we do have huge influence on everything, as you know, from energy to where we want to be sustainably to social uh, value to, again, I think ideas of what beauty in the all-encompassing sense uh, should be for, for the, the built environment. So. Well, I hope all of you were as inspired as I was by these extraordinary images and by Gail's um, <clears throat> challenge for us to expect beauty and let it play a role in our everyday life. So please join me in thanking our very special guest, Gail Peter Borden.